Um, -da -dum -ba -da -dum. Bum -ba -da -dum -da -da -da. Hello, hello, hello. What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? All right. Turn this little monitor thing off. How's it going? How's it going? Long time no see. <laughs> oh, what's going on in my my mouth? Isn't working. There we go. Hey, bliss. Working, working, working. Um. All right. Yeah. So this is the Sunday one. Uh, the Sunday, the first Sunday that we're doing here. I uh, plan on doing Sundays and Thursdays, 6.30 p.m. PST. Um, last week, we had, uh, we met Marvin. Be uh, who is that? God, I always forget that dude's name. Uh, something Beeblebrox. They're on that improbability ship. Uh, it's got that girl. And, uh... Arthur and, and, uh, whatchamacallum, oh my god, hello, words, what's the other dude's name? Arthur Dent and Ford Prefix. Um, they, what did happen actually, oh yeah, there was some, some crazy, so they were getting, like, chased whenever they went to that building, or, not the building, the planet that, um, was on, like, that dark cloud or whatever, and it was supposedly like where all of the riches and treasures were for like the whole galaxy and then all of a sudden there was like a defense mechanism for the planet because it was like it was already dead for like so many years but they still had the missile defense or whatever i guess and uh they had like nuclear missiles that were like following them and then uh there was like an explosion of noise and light and then it was just like it ended so, now we're going through from that. Um, let me switch over to my book. And we will get going. Chapter 18. And the next thing that happened after that was the Heart of Gold continued on its way perfectly normally with a rather fetchingly redesigned interior. It was somewhat larger and done out in delicate past pastel shades of green and blue. In the center, a spiral staircase, leading nowhere in particular, stood in a spray of ferns and yellow flowers, and next to it, a stone sundial pedestal housed the main computer terminal. Cunningly deployed lighting and mirrors created the illusion of standing in a conservatory overlooking a wide stretch of ex exquisitely manicured garden. Around the periphery of the conservatory area stood marble-topped tables on intricately beautiful wrought iron legs. As you gazed into the polished surface of the marble, the vague forms of instruments became visible, and as you touched them, the instruments materialized instantly under your hands. Looked at from the correct angles, the mirrors appeared to reflect all the required data readouts, though it was far from clear where they were reflected from. It was, in fact, sensationally beautiful. Relaxing in a wickerwick sun chair, Zaphod Beeblebrock said, What the hell happened? Well, I was just saying, said Arthur, lounging by a small fish pool. There's this improbability drive switch over here. He waved at where it had been. There was a potted plant there now. But where are we? said Ford, who was sitting on the spiral staircase, a nicely chilled pan-galactic gargle blaster in his hand. Exactly where we were, I think, said Trillian, as all about them the mirror suddenly showed them an image of the blighted landscape of Magrathia, which still scooted along beneath them. Zephod leapt out of his seat. Then what's happened to the missiles? He said. A new and astounding image appeared in the mirrors. They would appear, said Ford doubtfully, to have turned into a bowl of petunias and a very surprised looking whale. At an improbability factor, cut in Eddie, who hadn't changed a bit, of 8,767,128 to 1 against. Zephod stared at Arthur. Did you think of that, Earthman? He demanded. Well, said Arthur, all I did was... That's very good thinking, you know. Turn on the improbability drive for a second without act first activating the proofing screens. Hey, kid, you just saved our lives. You know that? Oh, said Arthur. Well, it was nothing, really. Was it? said Zephod. Oh, well, forget it then. Okay, computer, take us in to land. But, I said forget it. 
Another thing that got forgotten was the fact that against all improbability, a sperm whale had suddenly been called into existence several miles above the surface of an alien planet. And since this is not a naturally tenable position for a whale, this poor innocent creature had very little time to come to terms with the identity with its identity as a whale before it had then come to terms with not being a whale anymore. This is a complete record of its thought from the moment it began its life until the moment it ended it. Ah! What's happening? It thought. Uh, excuse me, who am I? Hello? Why am I here? What's my purpose in life? What do I mean by who am I? Calm down. Get a grip now. Oh, this is an interesting sensation. What is it? It's a sort of yawning, tingling sensation in my... my... Well, I suppose I'd better start finding names for things if I want to make any headway in what, for the sake of what I shall call an argument, an argument I shall call the world, so let's call it my stomach. Good. Ooh, it's getting quite strong. And hey, what about this whistling, roaring sound going past what I'm suddenly going to call my head? Perhaps I can call that... Wind. Is that a good name? It'll do. Perhaps I can find a better name for it later when I've found what it's for. It must be something very important, because there certainly seems to be a hell of a lot of it. Hey, what is this thing? This... Let's call it a tail. Yeah. Tail. Hey, I can really thrash about it pretty good, can I? Wow. Wow, that feels great. Doesn't seem to achieve very much, but I'll probably find out what it's for later on. Now, have I built up any coherent picture of things yet? No. Never mind. Hey, this is really exciting. So much to find out about. So much to look forward to. I'm quite dizzy with anticipation. Or is it the wind? There really is a lot of that now, isn't there? And wow. Hey, what's this thing suddenly coming out? Coming toward me very fast. Very, very fast. So big and flat and round. It needs a big, wide sounding name like. Ow, round. Round. Ground. That's it. That's a good name. Ground. I wonder if it'll be friends with me. And the rest, after a sudden wet thud, was silence. Curiously enough, the only thing that went through the mind of the bull of petunias as it fell was, oh no, not again. Many people have speculated that if we knew exactly why the bull of petunias had thought what we would now, what we would know a lot more about the nature of the universe than we do now. End of chapter 18. Chapter 19. Are we taking this robot with us? said Ford, looking with distaste at Marvin, who was standing in an awkward hunch posture in the corner under a small palm tree. The fog glanced away from the mirror screens which presented a panoramic view of the blighted landscape on which the heart of gold had now landed. Oh, the panor paranoid android, he said. Yeah, we'll take him. But what are you supposed to do with a man manically depressed robot? You think you've got problems, said Marvin, as if he was addressing a newly occupied coffin. What are you supposed to do if you are a manically depressed robot? No, don't bother to answer that. I'm 50,000 times more intelligent than you, and even I don't know the answer. It gives me a headache just trying to think down to your level. Trillian burst in through the door from her cabin. My white mice have escaped, she said. An expression of deep worry and concern failed to cross either of Zafad's faces. Nuts to your white mice, he said. Trillian glared an upset glare at him and disappeared again. It's possible that her, remike, her remark would have commanded greater attention had it been generally realized that human beings were only the third most intelligent life form present on the planet Earth, instead of, as was generally thought by most independent observers, the second. Good afternoon, boys. The voice was oddly familiar, but oddly different. It had a matriarchal twang. It announced itself to the crew as they arrived at the airlock hatchway that would let them out on the planet's surface. They looked at each other in puzzlement. It's the computer, explained Zafad. I discovered it had an emergency backup personality that I thought might work out better. Now this is going to be your first day out on a strange new planet, continued Eddie's new voice. So I want you all wrapped up snug and warm, and no playing with any naughty bug-eyed monsters. Zafad tapped impatiently on the hatch. I'm sorry, he said. I think we might be better off with a slide rule. Right, snapped the computer. 
Who said that? Will you open up the exit hatch, please, computer? Said Zafad, trying not to get angry. Not until whoever said that owns up, urged the computer, stamping a few synapses closed. Oh god, muttered Ford, slumped against a bulkhead. He started to count to ten. He was desperately worried that one day sentient life forms would forget how to do this. Only by counting would, could humans demonstrate their independence of computers. Come on, said Eddie sternly. Computer, began Safad. I'm waiting, interrupted Eddie. I can wait all day if necessary. Computer, said Safad again, who had been trying to think of a, some subtle piece of reasoning to put the computer down with, and had decided not to bother competing with it on its own ground. If you don't open that exit hatch this moment, I shall zap straight off to your major data banks and reprogram you with a very large axe. Got that? Eddie, shocked, paused and considered this. Ford carried on counting quietly. This is about the most aggressive thing you can do to a computer. The equivalent of going up a human being going up to a human being and saying, Blood. 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 Finally, Eddie said quietly. I can see this relationship is something we're all going to have to work at. And the hatchway opened. An icy wind ripped into them. They hugged themselves warmly and stepped out down the ramp onto the barren dust of Magrathia. It'll all end in tears, I know it, shouted Eddie after them and closed the hatchway again. A few minutes later, he opened and closed the hatchway again in response to a command that caught him entirely by surprise. End of chapter 19. Chapter 20. Five figures wandered slowly over the blighted land. Bits of it were dullish gray, bits of it dullish brown, the rest of it rather less interesting to look at. It was like a dried out marsh, now barren of all vegetation and covered with a layer of dust about an inch thick. It was very cold. Zafad was clearly rather depressed about it. He stalked off by himself and was soon lost to sight behind a slight, behind a slight rise in the ground. The wind stung Arthur's eyes and ears, and the stale thin air clasped his throat. However, the thing that was stung most was its mind. It's fantastic, he said, and his own voice rattled his ears. Sound carried badly in this thin atmosphere. Desolate hole, if you ask me, said Ford. I could have more fun in a cat litter. He felt a mounting irritation. Of all the planets and all the star systems of all the galaxy, many wild and exotic, seething with life, didn't he just have to turn up at a dump like this after fifteen years of being a castaway? Not even a hot dog stand in evidence. He stooped down and picked up a cold clod of earth, but there was nothing underneath it worth crossing thousands of light years to look at. No, insisted Arthur. Don't you understand? This is the first time I've actually stood on the surface of another planet. A whole alien world. Pity it's such a dump, though. Trillian hugged herself, shivered and frowned. She could have sworn she saw a slight and unexpected movement out of the corner of her eye, but when she glanced in that direction, all she could see was the ship, still and silent, a hundred yards or so behind them. She was relieved when a second or so later they caught sight of Zafad standing on top of the ridge of ground and waving to them to come and join him. He seemed to be excited, but they couldn't clearly hear what he was saying because of the thinnish atmosphere and the wind. As they approached the ridge of higher ground, they became aware that it seemed to be circular, a crater about 150 yards wide. Round the outside of the crater, the sloping ground was splattered with black and red lumps. They stopped and looked at a piece. It was wet and rubbery. With horror, they suddenly realized that it was fresh whale meat. At the top of the crater's lip, they met Zafad. Look, he said, pointing into the crater. In the center lay the exploded carcass of a lonely sperm whale that hadn't lived long enough to be disappointed with his lot. The silence was only disturbed by the slight involuntary spasms of Trillian's throat. I suppose there's no point in trying to bury it, murmured Arthur, and then wished he hadn't. Come, said Zafad, and started back down the cra into the crater. What, down there? said Trillian with severe distaste. Yeah, said Zafad. Come on, I've got something to show you. We can see it, said Trillian. Not that, said Zafad. Something else. Come on. They all hesitated. Come on, insisted Zafad. I found a way in. In, said Arthur with in horror. 
Into the interior of the planet, an underground passage. The force of the whale's impact cracked it open, and that's where we have to go, where no man has trod these five million years into the very depths of time itself. Marvin started his ironical humming again. Zafad hit him, and he shut up. With little shudders of disgust, they all followed Zafad down the incline into the crater, trying very hard to avoid looking at its unfortunate creator. Life, said Marvin dolefully. Loathe it or ignore it. You can't hide it. The ground had caved in where the whale had hit it, revealing a network of galleries and passages now largely obstructed by a collapsed rubble and end entrails. Zafad had made a start clearing a way into one of them, but Marvin was able to do it rather faster. Dank air wi wa wafted out of its dark re recesses, and as Zafad shone a flashlight into it, little was visible in the dusty gloom. According to the legends, he said, the McGrathians lived most of their lives underground. Why is that? said Arthur. Did the surface become too polluted or overpopulated? No, I don't think so, said Zafad. I think they just didn't like it very much. Are you sure you know what you're doing? said Trillian, peering nervously into the darkness. We've been attacked once already, you know. Look, kid, I promise you the live population of this planet is nil plus the four of us, so come on, let's get on in there. Uh, hey, Earthman. Arthur, said Arthur. Yeah, could you just sort out of, sort of keep this robot with you and guard this end of the passageway, okay? Guard, said Arthur. What from? You just said there's no one here. Yeah, well, just for safety, okay? Said Zafad. Whose? Yours or mine? Good lad. Okay, here we go. Zafad scrambled down into the passage, followed by Trillian and Ford. Well, I hope you all have a really miserable time, complained Arthur. Don't worry, Marvin assured him. They will. In a few seconds, they had disappeared from view. Arthur stamped around in a huff, and then decided that a whale's graveyard is not on the whole a good place to stamp around in. Marvin eyed him balefully for a moment, and then turned himself off. The Foz marched quickly down the passageway, nervous as, hell, nervous as hell, but trying to hide it by striding purposefully. He flung the beam around. The walls were covered in dark tiles and were cold to the touch, the air thick with decay. There, what did I tell you, he said, an inhabited planet, Magrathia, and he strode on through the dirt and debris that littered the tile floors. Trillian was reminded unavoidably of the London Underground, though it was less thoroughly squalid. At intervals along the walls, and the tiles gave way to large mosaics, simple angular, simple angular patterns in bright colors. Trillian stopped and studied one of them, but could not interpret any sense of them. She called to Zafad. Hey, have you any idea what the strange symbols are? I think they're just strange symbols of some kind, said Zafad, hardly glancing back. Trillian shrugged and hurried after him. From time to time, a doorway led either to the left or right into smallish chambers, which Ford discovered to be full of derelict computer equipment. He dragged Zafad into one to have a look. Trillian followed. Look, said Ford, you reckon this is McGrathia? Yeah, said Zafad, and we heard the voice, right? Okay, so I've brought, I've bought the fact that it's McGrathia, for the moment. What you have so far, what you have so far said nothing about is how the, in the galaxy you found it. You didn't just look it up in a star atlas, that's for sure. Research. Government archives. Detective work. Few lucky guesses. Easy. And then you stole the heart of gold to come and look for it with? I stole it to look for a lot of things. A lot of things? Said Ford in surprise. Like what? I don't know. What? I don't know what I'm looking for. What not? Because... Because... I think it might be because if I knew I wouldn't be able to look for them. What? Are you crazy? It's a possibility I haven't ruled out yet said Zafad quietly. I only know as much about myself as my mind can work out under its current conditions, and its current conditions are not good. For a long time, nobody said anything as Ford gazed at Zafad with a mind suddenly full of worry. Listen, old friend, if you want to... started Ford eventually. 
No, wait. I'll tell you something, said Zafad. I freewheel a lot. I get an idea to do something, and hey, why not? I do it. I reckon I'll become president of the galaxy, and it just happens. It's easy. I decide to steal a ship. I decide to look for Magrathia, and it all just happens. Yeah, I work out how it can best be done, right? But it always works out. It's like be having a galactic reddit card which keeps on working through your, through you, though you never send off the checks. And then I, and then whenever I stop and think, why did I want to do something? How did I work on how to do it? I get a very strong desire just to stop thinking about it, like I have now. It's a big effort to talk about it. Zafad paused for a while. For a while there was silence. Then he frowned and said, Last night I was worrying about this again, about the fact that part of my mind just didn't seem to work properly. Then it occurred to me that the way it seemed was that someone else was using my mind to have good ideas with, without telling me about it. I put the two ideas together and decided that maybe that somebody had locked off part of my mind for that purpose, which was why I couldn't use it. I wondered if there was a way I could check. I went to the ship's medical bay and plugged myself into the encephalographic screen. I went through every major screening test on both my heads, all the tests I had to go through under government medical officers before my nomination for presidency could be properly ratified. They showed up nothing. Nothing ex unexpected, at least. They showed that I was clever, imaginative, irresponsible, untrustworthy, extrovert, nothing you couldn't have guessed, and no other anomalies, so I started inventing further tests completely at random. Nothing. Then I tried superimposing the results from one head on top of the results from the other head. Still nothing. Finally I got silly because I'd given it all up as nothing more than an attack of paranoia. Last thing I did before I packed it in was take the superimposed picture and look at it through a green filter. You remember I was always superstitious about the color green when I was a kid? I always wanted to be a pilot on one of the trading scouts. Ford nodded. And there it was, said Zafad, clear as day. A whole section in the middle of both brains that related only to each other and not to anything else around them. Some bastard had cauterized all the synapses and electronically tra traumatized those two lumps of cerebellum. Ford stared at him, aghast. Trillian had turned white. Somebody did that to you? Whispered Ford. Yeah. But have you any idea who? Or why? Why? I can only guess, but I do know who the bastard was. You know, but how do you know? Because they left their initials burned into the cauterized synapses. They left them there for me to see. Ford stared at him in horror and felt his skin begin to crawl. Initials? Burned into your your brain? Yeah. Well, what were they, for God's sake? Zafad looked at him in silence again for a moment. Then he looked away. ZB, he said quietly. At that moment, a steel shutter slammed down behind them, and gas started to pour into the chamber. <coughs> I'll tell you about it later, choked Zafad as all three passed out. End of chapter 20. Chapter 21 On the surface of McGrathia, Arthur wandered about moodily. Ford had, thought, had thoughtfully left him his copy of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy to while away the time with. He pushed a few buttons at random. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is a very unevenly edited book and contains many passages that simply seem to its editors like a good idea at the time. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is a very unevenly edited book that contains many passages that simply seem to its editors like a good idea at the time. One of these, the one Arthur now came across, supposedly relates the experiences of one Viet Vojigig, a quiet young student at the University of Maximiglon who pursued a brilliant academic career studying ancient philology, transformational ethics, and the wave harmonic theory of historical perception, and then, after a night of drinking pan-galactic gargle blasters with Zafad Beeblebrox, became increasingly obsessed with the problem of what had happened to all the ballpoints he'd bought over the past few years. There followed a long period of painstaking research during which he visited all the major centers of ballpoint loss throughout the galaxy and eventually came up with a quaint little theory which quite caught the public imagination at the time. Somewhere in the cosmos, he said, along with all the planets inhabited by humanoids, reptiloids, fishoids, walking treeoids, and super intelligent shades of the color blue, 
There was also a planet entirely given over to ballpoint life forms, and it was to this planet that unattended ballpoints would make their way, slipping away quietly through wormholes and in space to a world where they knew they could enjoy a uniquely ballpointed ballpointoid lifestyle, responding to highly ballpoint-oriented stimuli and generally leading the ballpoint equivalent of the good life. And as theories go, this was all very fine and pleasant until Viet Vojigig suddenly claimed to have found this planet and to have worked there for a while driving a limousine for a family of cheap green retra retractables, whereupon he was taken away, locked up, wrote a book, and was finally sent to into tax exile, which is the usual fate reserved for those who are determined to make fools of themselves in public. When one day an expedition was sent to the spatial coordinates that Vojigig had claimed for this planet, they discovered only a small asteroid inhabited by a solitary old man who claimed repeatedly that nothing was true, though he was later discovered to be lying. There did, however, remain the question of both the mysterious 60,000 Altarian dollars paid yearly into his Brantisvogan bank account and, of course, Safad Vibelbrox's highly profitable second-hand ballpoint business. Arthur read this and put the book down. The robot still sat there, completely inert. Arthur got up and walked to the top of the crater. He walked around the crater. He watched two suns set magnificently over McGrathia. He went back down into the crater. He woke the robot up because even a manically depressed robot is better to talk to than nobody. Night's falling, he said. Look, robot, stars are coming out. From the heart of a dark nebula, it is possible to see very few stars, and only very faintly, but they were there to be seen. The robot obediently looked at them, then looked back. I know, he said. Wretched, isn't it? But that sunset! I've never seen anything like it in my wildest dreams. The two suns? It was like mountains of fire boiling into space. I've seen it, said Marvin. It's rubbish. We only ever had the sun at home. We only ever had the, sun, the one sun at home, pers persevered Arthur. I came from a planet called Earth, you know. I know, said Marvin. You keep going on about it. It sounds awful. Ah, no. It was a beautiful place. Did it have oceans? Oh, yes, said Arthur with a sigh. Great, wide, rolling blue oceans. Can't bear oceans, said Marvin. Tell me, inquired Arthur, do you get on well with other robots? I hate them, said Marvin. Where are you going? Arthur couldn't bear any more. He had got up again. I think I'll just take another walk, he said. Don't blame you, said Marvin, had encountered 597 billion sheep before falling asleep again a second later. Arthur slapped his arms about himself to try and get his circulation a little more enthusiastic about its job. He trudged back up the wall of the crater. Because the atmosphere was so thin, and because there was no moon, nightfall was very rapid and it was by now very dark. Because of this, Arthur practically walked into the old man before he noticed him. End of chapter 21 Chapter 22 He was standing with his back to Arthur, watching the very last glimmers of light sink into blackness behind the horizon. He was tallish, elderly, and dressed in a single long gray robe. When he turned, his face was thin and distinguished, careworn but not unkind, the sort of face you would happily bank with. But he didn't turn yet, not even to react to Arthur's yelp of surprise. Eventually the last rays of sun vanquished completely, and he turned. His face was, his face was still illuminated from somewhere, and when Arthur looked for the source of the light, he saw that a few yards away stood a small craft of some kind. A small hovercraft, Arthur guessed. It shed a dim pool of light around it. The man looked at Arthur, sadly it seemed. You chose a cold night to visit our dead planet, he said. Who, who are you? stammered Arthur. The man looked away. Again a look of sadness seemed to cross his face. My name is not important, he said. He seemed to have something on his mind. Conversation was clearly something he felt he didn't have to rush at. Arthur felt awkward. I, uh... You startled me, he said lamely. The man looked around him to, again and slightly raised his eyebrows. Hmm? 
he said. I said you startled me. Do not be alarmed. I will not harm you. Arthur frowned at him. But you shot at us. They were missiles, he said. The man gazed into the pit of the crater. The slight glow from Marvin's eyes cast very faint red shadows on the huge carcass of the whale. The man chuckled slightly. An automatic system, he said, and gave a small sigh. Ancient computers ranged in the bowels of the planet tick away the dark millennia, and the ages hang heavy on their dusty databanks. I think they take the occasional pot shot to relieve the monotony. He looked gravely at Arthur and said, I'm a great fan of science, you know. Oh, uh, really? said Arthur, who was beginning to find the man's curious, kindly manner disconcerting. Oh, yes, said the old man, and simply stopped talking again. Ah, said Arthur. Uh, he had an odd feeling of being like a man in the act of adultery, who is surprised when the woman's husband wanders into the room, changes his tra trousers, passes a few idle remarks about the weather, and leaves again. You seem ill at ease, said the old man with polite concern. Uh, no. Well, yes. Actually, you see, we weren't really expecting to find anybody about, in fact. I sort of gathered that you were all dead or something. Dead? said the old man. Good gracious me, no. But we have but slept. Slept? said Arthur incredulously. Yes, through the economic recession, you see, said the old man apparently unconcerned about whether Arthur understood a vo word he was talking about or not. Arthur had to prompt him again. Uh, economic recession? Well, you see, five million years ago, the galactic econ economy had collapsed, and seeing that custom-built planets are something of a luxury commodity, you see. He paused and looked at Arthur. You know we built planets, do you? He asked solemnly. Well... Yes, said Arthur. I sort of gathered. Fascinating trade, said the old man, and a wistful look came into his eyes. Doing the coastlines was always my favorite. Used to have endless fun doing the little bits and fjords. So anyway, he said, trying to find his thread again. The recession came. We decided it would save a lot of bother if we just slept through it. So we programmed the computers to revive us when it was all over. The man stifled a very slight yawn and continued. The computers were indexed linked to the galactic stock market prices, you see, so that we'd all be revived when everybody else had rebuilt the economy enough to afford our rather expensive services. Arthur, a regular Guardian reader, was deeply shocked at this. That's a pretty unpleasant way to behave, isn't it? Is it? said the old man mildly. I'm sorry. I'm a bit out of touch. He pointed down into the crater. Is that robot yours? He said. No, said a thin metallic voice from the crater. I'm mine. You'd call it a robot, muttered Arthur. It's more of a sort of electronic sulking machine. Bring it, said the old man. Arthur was quite surprised to hear a note of decision suddenly present in the old man's voice. He called to Marvin, who crawled up the slope, making a big show of being lame, which he wasn't. On second thoughts, said the old man, leave it here. You must come with me. Great things are afoot. He turned toward his craft, which, though no apparent signal had been given, now drifted quietly toward them through the dark. Arthur looked down at Marvin, who now made an equally big show of turning around laboriously and trudging off down into the crater again, muttering sour nothings to himself. Come, said the old man. Come now, or you'll be late. Late? said Arthur. What for? What's your name, human? Dent. Arthur Dent, said Arthur. Late, as in the late Den Dent Arthur Dent, said the old man sternly. It's a sort of threat, you see. Another wistful look came into his tired old eyes. I've never been very good at them myself, but I'm told they can be very effective. Arthur blinked at him. What an extraordinary person, he muttered to himself. I beg your pardon? said the old man. Oh, nothing. I'm sorry, said Arthur in embarrassment. All right, where do we go? In my air car, said the old man, motioning Arthur to get into the craft, which had settled silently next to them. We're going deep into the bowels of the planet, where even now our race is being revived from its five million year slumber. 
Magrathia awakes. Arthur shivered involuntarily as he seated himself next to the old man. The strangeness of it, the silent bobbing movement of the craft as it soared into the night sky, quite unsettled him. He looked at the old man, his face illuminated by the dull glow of tiny lights on the instrument panel. Excuse me, he said to him. What is your name, by the way? My name? said the old man, and then same distant sadness came into his face again. He paused. My name, he said, is Slartibartfest. Arthur practically choked. I beg your pardon? he spluttered. Slartibartfest, repeated the old man quietly. Slartibartfest? The old man looked at him gravely. Said it wasn't important, he said. The air car sailed through the night. End of chapter 22. All right, chapter 23. It is important. It is an important and popular fact that things are not always what they seem. For instance, on the planet Earth, man had always assumed that he was more intelligent than dolphins because he had achieved so much. The wheel, New York, wars, and so on, while all the dolphins had ever done was muck about in the water having a good time. But conversely, the dolphins had always believed that they were far more intelligent than man, for precisely the same reasons. Curiously enough, the dolphins had long known of the impending destruction of the planet Earth, and had made many attempts to alert mankind to the danger, but most of their communications were misinterpreted as amusing attempts to punch footballs or whistle for tidbits, so they eventually gave up and left the Earth by their own means shortly before the Vogons arrived. The last ever dolphin message was misinterpreted as a surprisingly sophisticated attempt to do a double backward somersault through a hoop while whistling the Star Spangled Banner, but in fact the message was this, so long and thanks for all the fish. In fact there was only one species on the planet more intelligent than dolphins, and they spent a lot of their time in behavioral research laboratories running around inside wheels and conducting frighteningly elegant and subtle experiments on man. The fact that once again man completely misinterpreted this relationship was entirely according to those creatures' plans. End of chapter 23. Chapter 24. Silently the air car coasted through the cold darkness, a single soft glow of light that was utterly alone in the deep McGrathian night. It sped swiftly. Arthur's companion seemed sunk in his own thoughts, and when Arthur tried on a couple of occasions to engage him in conversation again, he would simply reply by asking if he was com comfortable enough, and then left it at that. Arthur tried to gauge the speed at which they were traveling, but the blackness outside was absolute and he was denied any reference points. The sense of motion was so soft and slight he could almost believe they were hardly moving at all. Then a tiny, tiny glow of light appeared in the far distance and within seconds had grown so much in size that Arthur realized it was traveling toward them at a colossal speed, and he tried to make out what sort of craft it might be. He peered at it, but was unable to discern any clear shape, and suddenly gasped in alarm as the air car dipped sharply and headed downward in what seemed certain to be a collision course. Their relative velocity seemed unbelievable, and Arthur had hardly come to draw breath before it was all over. The next thing he was aware of was an insane silver blur that seemed to surround him. He twisted his head sharply around and saw a small black point dwindling rapidly in the distance behind them, and it took him several seconds to realize what had just happened. They had plunged into a, a tunnel in the ground. The colossal speed had been their own, relative to the glow of light which was a stationary hole in the ground, the mouth of the tunnel. The insane blur of silver was the circular wall of the tunnel down which they were shooting, apparently at several hundred miles an hour. He closed his eyes in terror. After a length of time which he made no attempt to judge, he sensed a slight subsidence in their speed, and some while later became aware that they were gradually gliding to a gentle halt. He opened his eyes again. They were still in the, in the silver tunnel, threading and weaving their way through what appeared to be a crisscross warren of converging tunnels. When they finally stopped, it was a in a small chamber of curved steel. Several tunnels also had their termini here, and at the further end of the chamber, Arthur could see a large circle of dim, irritating light. It was irritating because it played tricks with the eyes. It was impossible to focus on it properly, or tell how, how near or far it was. Arthur guessed, quite wrongly, that it might be ultraviolet. Slarda Bartfist turned and regarded Arthur with his solemn old eyes. Earthman, he said, 
We're now in deep in the heart of Magrathia. How did you know I was an Earthman? demanded Arthur. These things will become clear to you, said the old man gently. At least, he added with a slight doubt in his voice, clearer than they are at the moment. He continued, I should warn you that the chamber we're about to pass into does not literally exist within our planet. It's a little too... large. We're about to pass through a gateway into a vast tract of hyperspace. It may disturb you. Arthur made nervous noises. Slaughter Bartfist touched a button and said, not entirely reassuringly, It scares the willies out of me. Hold tight. The car shot forward straight into the circle of light, and suddenly Arthur had a fairly clear idea of what infinity looked like. It wasn't infinity, in fact. Infinity itself looks flat and un uninteresting. Looking up into the night sky is looking into infinity. Distance is incomprehensible and therefore meaningless. The chamber into which the air car emerged was anything but infinite. It was just very, very, very big. So big that it gave the impression of infinity far better than infinity itself. Arthur's senses bobbed and spun as, traveling at the immense speed he knew the air car attained, they climbed slowly through the open air, leaving the gateway through which they had passed an invisible pinprick in the shimmering wall behind them. The wall. The wall defied the imagination, seduced it, and defeated it. The wall was so paralyzingly vast and sheer that its top, bottom, and sides passed way beyond the reach of sight. The mere shock of vertigo could kill a man. The wall appeared perfectly flat. It would take the finest laser, laser measuring equipment to detect that it is that as it climbed apparently to infinity, as it dropped dizzily away, as it planed out to either side, it also curved. It met itself again 13 light, year, light seconds away. In other words, the wall formed the inside of a hollow sphere a sphere over three million miles across and flooded with unimaginable light. Welcome, said Slarda Bartfist as the tiny speck that was the air car, traveling now at three times the speed of sound, crept imperceptibly forward into the mind-boggling space. Welcome, he said, to our factory floor. Arthur stared about him in a kind of wonderful horror. Ranged away before them, at distances he could neither judge nor even guess at, were a series of curious suspensions, delicate traceries of metal and light hung about shadowy spherical shapes that hung in the space. This, said Splatter Bartfist, is where we make most of our planets, you see. You mean, said Arthur, trying to form the words, you mean you're starting it all up again now? No, no, good heavens no, exclaimed the old man. No, the galaxy isn't nearly rich enough to support us yet. No, we've been awakened to perform just one extraordinary commission for very special clients from another dimension. It may interest you, there in the distance in front of us. Arthur followed the old man's finger till he was able to pick out the floating structure he was pointing out. It was indeed the only one of the many structures that betrayed any sign of activity around it, though this was more of a subliminal impression than anything one could put his finger put one's finger on at that moment however a flash of light arced through the structure and revealed in stark relief the patterns that were formed on the dark sphere within patterns that arthur knew rough blobby shapes that were as familiar to him as the shapes of words part of the furniture of his mind for a few seconds he sat in stunned silence as the images around his mind and tried as the images rushed around his mind and tried to find somewhere to settle down and make sense Part of his brain told him that he knew perfectly well what he was looking at and what the shapes represented while another quite sensibly refused to countenance the idea and ab abdicated responsibility for any further thinking in that direction. The flash came again, and this time there could be no doubt. The Earth, whispered Arthur. Well, the Earth Mark II, in fact, said Slarder Bartfish cheerfully. We're making a copy from our original blueprints. There was a pause. Are you trying to tell me, said Arthur slowly and with control, that you originally made the Earth? Oh yes, said Slider Barthus. Did you ever go to a place, I think it was called Norway? No, said Arthur. No, I didn't. Pity, said Slider Barthus. That was one of mine. Won an award, you know. Lovely crinkly edges. I was most upset to hear of his destruction. You were upset? Yes. 
five minutes later and it wouldn't have mattered so much. It was a quite shocking cock-up. Huh? said Arthur. The mice were furious. The mice were furious? Oh, yes, said the old man mildly. Yes, well, so I expect were the dogs and cats and duck-billed platypuses, but... Uh, but they hadn't paid for it, you see, had they? Look, said Arthur, would it save you a lot of time if I just gave up and went mad now? For a while, the air car flew on in awkward silence. Then the old man tried patiently to explain. Earthman, the planet you lived on was commissioned, paid for, and run by mice. It was destroyed five minutes before the completion of the purpose for which it was built. We've got to build another one. Only one word was registering with Arthur. Mice? He said. Indeed, Earthman. Look, sorry, are we talking about the little white furry things with the cheese fixation and women standing on tables screaming in the early 60s sitcoms? Sort of Bartfist coughed politely. Earthman, he said, it's sometimes hard to follow your mode of speech. Remember, I have been asleep inside this planet of Magrathia for five million years, and know little of these early 60s sitcoms in which you speak. These creatures you call mice, you see, they're not quite as they appear. They're merely the protrusion into our dimension of vastly hyper-intelligent pan-dimensional beings. The whole business with the cheese and the squeaking is just a front. The old man paused, and with a sympathetic frown continued. They've been experimenting on you, I'm, I'm afraid. Arthur thought about this for a second, and then his face cleared. Ah, uh, no, he said. I see the source of the misunderstanding now. No, look, you see what happened was that we used to do experiments on them. They were often used in behavioral research, Pavlov and all that sort of stuff. So what happened was that the mice would be set in all sort of tests, learning to ring bells, run around mazes and things so that the whole nature of the learning process could be examined. From our observations of their behavior, we were able to learn all sorts of things about our own... Arthur's voice trailed off. Such subtlety, said Slider Bartfist. One has to admire it. What? said Arthur. How better to disguise their real natures, and how better to guide your thinking? Suddenly running down a maze the wrong way, eating the wrong bit of cheese, unexpectedly dropping dead of myxomatosis. If it's finely calculated, the cumulative effect is enormous. He paused for effect. You see, Earthman, they really are particularly clever, hyper-intelligent, pan-dimensional beings. Your planet and people have formed the matrix of an organic computer running a 10 million year research program. Let me tell you the whole story. It'll take a little time. Time, said Arthur weakly, is not currently one of my problems. End of chapter 24. Oh, let's check this next chapter. Um, yeah... This next one's a little bit long, so I think we're going to end it there, um, and then we will start it back up this coming Thursday, same time, 6.30 PST. Um, yeah. Cool. That was fun. I, that was so funny. That was so funny. The mice? What the fuck? <laughs> That's so good. I honestly do not remember that. I don't know if that was in the movie at all but i did not know that that was like like a part of the story at all douglas motherfucking adams <laughs> that's so funny yeah I, I, there's a lot of parts in this book that i want to stop and just laugh but it's just like i gotta <laughs> i gotta go you know uh but yeah oh my god that's so good this book's great i really like this book i'm glad that i'm reading this and honestly, I'm glad that I'm, like, setting out times to do this, because it, like, it makes me keep going, you know? There's a... a terrible te Oh, like, a terrible, bad, but good 70s British TV show version of it. Yeah, so I've seen the, the movie. Um, I don't know what year the movie came out, but it's been a long time since I watched it, so, like, I kind of... I forgot a lot about it. Um, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy movie... All I remember from that is, uh, I remember Martin Freeman, um, being, being Arthur, but, uh, 2005, I remember, like, the number 42 thing, but that's about it, in Martin. 
Also a pretty popular radio drum reading of it. Yeah, I want to check out all of the, the different forms because that's also in the intro of this book is like him trying to explain like an order, but basically saying that there is no order um, and being super convoluted and confusing and <laughs> being Douglas Adams, I guess, you know? Uh, yeah, it's good shit. All right. Cool. All right, well, I'm going to uh, head back into this uh, BRB thing. I'm probably going to um, grab some food for a little bit. So I'll, I'll be I'll be on BRB for like five or ten minutes, and then uh, we'll get back going on to, to Elden Ring. But, yeah, thanks, for everybody, for watching. Um, appreciate you guys. Or listening, not watching. Or both, you know. Thanks for watching and listening. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I'll... Uh, Next reading stream will be on Thursday, like I said, and, uh, yeah, I'll be back for more Elden Ring. Yeah, you enjoyed it? Hell yeah. Da -da -da -da. Cool. All right, let me see if I can do this, uh, this outro thing again. Gotta rewatch. Yeah, oh yeah, and, uh, oh yeah, like the shows and all that stuff? Hell yeah. Um, but yeah, just a reminder for everybody on here, I'm gonna put Discord. I usually put updates for... Um, or like a reminder before the actual stream for the reading ones um, The normal ones like for Elden Ring. I'm just kind of I'm just kind of doing um, I don't I don't really like to tag everybody a lot um, and then the uh, YouTube is here You want to try my new scenes? I'll go live. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah um, I yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be on BRB here, but um, let's uh I don't think I have a clip thing on here, but shout out Blissful. Um, I, yeah, I'll be over there. Oh, what is going on? Hello? Oh my god. Oh, it's playing a clip on my, <laughs> it's playing a clip on my thing, but it's not for you guys. Um, yeah, sounds good, man. I'll, I'll be over there while I'm meeting. Um, but yeah. Uh, YouTube is where I post like all the VODs for uh, the reading streams, if uh, any of you don't know. And then eventually I'm going to be putting up like VODs or, or some other content on there. But as for right now, it's just for the reading. Um, but yeah, okay, cool. I'm going to head out of here and uh, I'll be back later on and I'll see you blissful in a sec. All right, let's see. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, let me put this book down. Uh... Ah, uh, there. Okay, goodbye, goodbye. Goodbye.